Open in prayer, Lord, we just thank you for this evening. We thank you for the opportunity to come worship you, to learn, hear about your word, get to know you more. Father, I just pray that it would bring you glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Purify my heart, let me be. 
creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Well, tonight I, I, um, I wanted to share some of my own personal struggle, and I know that a lot of other people struggle with it as well in the church, and it's, it's a problem that a lot of people see, and um, we all struggle with trials and afflictions, um, but it, and there's different types of trials, different types of um, afflictions that we, we struggle with. One in particular that I'm going to deal with tonight, I mean, because God is in control of all things, and he, he um, passively allows things to happen, and he actually causes things to happen, um, but in, in, in all of those things, he is omnipresent, all-knowing, he's sovereign over all those things, uh, he knows, he, he directs things to happen to us for our benefit, and, um, and that's what I want to see in, in this. So, you know, one of the things that happens, you know, we can lose the, uh, a loved one. That's something that's, that's out of our hands that God would actually cause. But there's things that happen within the church when people, you know, slander you or people outside the church, they slander you for being a Christian. And, and there, those, that type of affliction is what I want to deal with tonight. Um, and there's, there's some really good examples in Scripture um, of not only how Jesus dealt with it, but also how, how Paul and, and Peter and James, they tell us how to deal with those things. Um, and and we, ultimately, we want to look at Christ as our, our ultimate example. And those afflictions, when someone comes against us, it should lead us to forgiveness. 
And, and that's what I want to kind of correlate because a lot of people think that things happen in their life and they, I included, I feel justified in my anger. I feel sometimes I even realize when I have someone come against me or sin against me in a sense that I want to be angry because it's kind of mine to keep, you know, and uh, we should be quick to forgive. It should change our heart. These things are, are there to refine us as the song that we sang tonight, Refiner's Fire. So I had a situation with someone that that comes to the church, and they slandered me and said I was a false teacher and and different things. And and, and it should come to forgiveness. And and I'll just share Psalm 94, 12 says, Blessed is the man whom you chasten, O Lord, and whom you teach the law. And and that's, in a way, when, when those afflictions come through other people or through the world, God is using that individual to grow you and grow me. So I wanted to share that. So let's turn to James chapter 1. We're going to read a lot of scripture, and I'll I'll try not to make it as long as it was this morning. Bless Russ, it was an awesome sermon this morning, wasn't it? But James 1, 2, and 3. So um, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Or another word for that would be endurance, as the NASB would say. God allows trials to test our faith. But blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. From when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. So trials are to prove and strengthen our faith. Amen? That's, that's awesome. So now when, we, when things happen in our lives, let's change our perspective on that. I know I need to in my life. So I, I, I put this cool little um, illustration of the blacksmith. And, um, and you see him, he's hammering the hot steel. It has to be heated. And then he pounds on it with a hammer. And that steel does not want to go in the shape that he's forcing it to go to make it useful. That steel was just a piece of metal, right? It could have even been a, a pile of BBs or just pieces of metal or wood, or I mean not wood, sorry, wood. P- piles and scrap pieces of steel that could be melted down into a bar and then they're manipulated by the blacksmith. And he just pounds on it to manipulate it to go into the shape that he desires it. The steel doesn't want to go that direction. It resists it. That's why it requires an anvil and a hammer and a lot of heat. And that's what happens in our lives. So he's forming it, manipulating it in the shape he desires, and the metal does not want to go into that shape. And here's a cool little picture of that hammer just pounding it in there. So when he is done getting the desired shape, he will then apply a high heat for a period of time and then remove it from the fire and place it into a quench to cool it. I don't know if you've seen Forge and Fire. I know Ben said he, he was watching that before he came in today. But what that does, what does that do? It hardens the metal. And then you test it with a file that's already hard. That's what you test it against and check the hardness. And if it's not hard enough, and that's, if that file doesn't skate across that piece of steel, it's not hard enough. So what does he do? He puts it back in the fire, heats it up again, and then he quenches it. And, and what it does, that process, it actually changes the crystalline structure inside the metal. It changes it internally. Externally, it looks like a piece of metal. You can't tell externally. It doesn't change its shape. It, you know, sometimes a fire will warp it or things like that. But typically, it, it, it only changes the, the structure, the, the molecular crystalline structure inside the metal. You don't see it. And, and that's how I want to correlate that what these afflictions do. It's heat. It's pressure. Things in our life that these trials cause, but it changes us on the inside. You may not see it on the outside. Many of you may not have known that I, I, I was being attacked, in a sense, by someone in, in the church. Um, you know, and, and nothing against that person. I, I don't want, that's not, that doesn't matter. But what, what happened in the process to me is what matters. That was for my benefit. That was for me. And for me to share with the church, to see that God uses these things to change me on the inside. And, and hopefully benefit you as well. So it's kind of a 
a neat process when you when you think of it. So in uh, Psalm 103.10, we'll go there. I'll give you a minute to get there if you follow along. So one of the things is we're going through afflictions. A lot of people, um, you know, uh, view afflictions in a bad way, but they may come from God directly as discipline or from the world to refine us. But no matter how bad they seem, they will always be less than we deserve. So Psalm 103.10 says, He does not deal with with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. So when we're in Christ, we don't get what we deserve. We're inherently wicked. We're born in sin. We deserve hell for our iniquity. And yet God sent his son to die for us and, and take on our iniquities upon himself, even though he was perfect, and then impute his righteousness and perfect life onto us. So when God's eye, God the Father sees us, he sees his son. He doesn't see our iniquities. So let's, let's go to 1 Peter. I'm gonna, I, I wanted to go through the whole book of 1 Peter. It's a lot, so I'm just going to point out, that, and, and what was going on in, in 1 Peter, or Peter, for, yeah, 1 Peter, is, is Paul, or Peter's dealing with the church, and, uh, and Nero was persecuting the Christians. So I, I've got a little background I'll read for you. This comes out of the John MacArthur Study Bible. And it just gives a little background in history of what was going on in Rome at that time. And uh, so when the city of Rome burned, the Romans believed that Emperor Nero had set the city on fire, probably because of his incredible lust to build. He just wanted to build. In order to build more, he had to destroy what already existed. The Romans were totally devastated. Their culture, in a sense, went down with the city. All the religious elements of their life were destroyed. Their great temples, shrines, and even their household idols were burned up. This had to be had great religious implications because it made them believe that their deities had been unable to deal with this conflagration and were also victims of it. The people were homeless and hopeless. Many had been killed. Their bitter resentment was severe, so Nero realized that he had to redirect the hostility. And the emperor's chosen scapegoat was the Christians, who were already hated because they were associated with the Jews and because they were seen as being hostile to the Roman culture. Nero spread the word quickly that the Christians had set the fires, and as a result, a vicious persecution among Christians began and soon and spread throughout the Roman Empire. So, so he, it was wicked what they did to the Christians there, to the point that they were putting Christians on posts and lighting them on fire and using them to light the pathways. That's wicked. But here's an interesting thing. When you read, he doesn't tell us to rise up and go out and get your vote in. He doesn't. And so that's, he doesn't say we need to change the administration. We have to change who the emperor is. We need to get him out of the, out of the palace and, and turn this whole environment over. He doesn't. He doesn't say that at all. So we'll read uh, um, 1 Peter verse 1, or I mean 1 Peter 1 3. So blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Isn't that amazing? Why are we focused on what Nero's doing? We've got something greater that's coming. That's what he's saying here. Verse 5 and 6, Who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have grieved by, been grieved by various trials. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So he's saying that these tests are there to test your faith, to see how genuine your faith is. God had a hand in this. He allowed this to happen. He allowed, he, he put Nero in power. He knew that he would do this. 
And he knew that the Christians would be persecuted. But ultimately, God would get the glory for this. And he continues on to encourage, um, encourage the church of Rome. And we're going to go to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. So he says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. Isn't that amazing? So here he is, he's reiterating, this, they're going through the trials. They're being burned at the stake. They're being tortured. And, <clears throat> and wicked things are happening to them. So he's encouraging them. And he, and he continues on encouraging. And then he goes to, to verse 12. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. He's not saying to go against them. He's not saying rise up against them. We need to fight them. We need to gather everybody together. We need to get the polls and, and make sure everybody's voting. You know, and that's not a bad thing to do, but it should not be our focus. And he says, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to the governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to the praise of those who do good. Be subject to, for the Lord's sake to every human institution. Our government's one of those. For, for this is the will of God, that by doing good you shall put to silence the ignorance of the foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom to cover up for evil but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the emperor. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. He's saying we can endure it. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure it, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. It's verse 20. I forgot to tell you, I, I kind of skipped a little bit. Verse 21 and 22. For this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his, foot, in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. And when he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who ju judges justly. He himself bore our sins to his body on a tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and the overseer of our souls. So he's not saying we need to go rise up against Nero. He's saying we have to take this persecution because he's got a greater thing in store for us. When someone comes against you, he's got something greater. He was refining the church at that time. He was weeding out those that that didn't have faith. There were, there, in this country, if we, when we see persecution, you're going to see a separation of the true church and the false church. You're going to see it. And I know of stories where, where they've done that in other countries where armed men came into the church and said, if you recant your faith, then you could stay. You'll live. And a whole bunch of people left. They put their guns down and they did a Bible study because they wanted to weed out who really wasn't in the faith. Doesn't mean it's right or wrong, but it's a way to find out. But he continues, and we're going to jump to, to chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. 
But in your hearts, honor Christ, the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason of the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. So the, somebody's racking, you, racking your feet, and you're still praising God, and you're still loving that person that's doing it to you. What does it show them? I've heard of stories of, uh, the, uh, of Islam in Africa and in the Middle East where they're taking Christians and they're beating them. And these people just praise God, and they love on the people that are beating them. And there's been instances where these people have to stop. They can't do it anymore. And they come to Christ because they see the witness of these people that they're abusing. What an amazing thing. Didn't we see that with, with Paul? God changed Paul. Here he was he, was, he was beating and killing Christians. He was actually one that charged Stephen and had, them, had him killed. And uh, it, what an amazing thing that God would take him and change him miraculously, turn him into a, a new creation in him, and he wrote most of the New Testament. God used him mightily. And he allowed him to go through many afflictions. And what are those afflictions? What did they do, John? They humbled him, didn't they? <laughs> and refined him. It's, it's humbling to be refined, isn't it? <laughs> Verses uh, 16 and 17. Having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will than for doing evil. They will be put to shame. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. See, Christ is our example. So when we have people come against us, it doesn't matter what the affliction is. They could be banging on our door, wanting to take all of our stuff, wanting to kill us, whatever, take, take our kids you know, what, you name it. I mean, any, any wicked thing, they're hating you because of Christ. They're not hating you because of who you are. Hopefully, he says, don't do evil things. Don't give them reason to hate you. Don't, don't give them reason to hate you for the evil that you're doing. Give them a reason to hate you because of Christ. <laughs> That's a great thing. So in 1 Peter 4, um, 4, 8 through 10, we we'll jump a little bit ahead. And I would recommend that you take 1 Peter and just read through it. One of the things that, that, that I notice with the epistles is it's better to, to sit and read through it, the whole thing, because Paul or Peter or John, they're trying to get a point out through the whole letter. It's a single letter. He didn't just send them like bits and pieces of the letter. It's all one letter so that you can get the context and what he's trying to explain and, and encourage you in, whether it, it be a persecution or righteousness or um, the Galatians, it was legalism that they fell into. Um, so 1 Peter uh, 4, 8 through 10, or yeah. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God, or God's varied grace. Beloved, do not be surprised at a fire trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as to share in Christ's suffering, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed." To rejoice in suffering for his sake. What a beautiful thing that is. I know that Terry, Terry doesn't want to die as a martyr, but it would be a glorious thing, wouldn't it be? I don't want to either, but it'd still be an honor to die for our Savior, for his sake. Wow. I mean, it, it's terrible to think about, but what a glorious thing. Because in this life, it's not about what we're doing here. It's, it, it's not about the worldly things. It's about greater things. It's, it's about God's glory being revealed in us. We'll go to 14. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. 
But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glory or glorify God in that name. It's amazing. He's saying, don't be caught in sin. Don't suffer because you're a sinner, because you're caught in drunkenness or you've, you've you know, done some wicked things. We're not to be caught up in that stuff. 17, he says, for it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? Wow. Judgment has begun in the household of God. What would the outcome be for those who don't obey? That's a sorry day for them. And that's why we need to get out and preach the gospel. We need to live it out in our lives as well. He says, and if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let us who suffer according to God's will and trust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. We'll skip to um, chapter 5, verse 10 and 11. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So no matter what happens to you in this life, through these afflictions, these struggles, I mean, I had a minor thing happen. Somebody slandered me. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It, it's, it's not good to pay evil for evil. I can go and try to defend myself and do the same thing he did. And What benefit is that? There's no benefit to that. It's, that's sin. I don't need to go into sin because of what, what he's doing or what he thinks. I don't even have to defend myself. Why? God knows the truth. He's got me prepared for something greater. I don't need to worry about that stuff. So where does the forgiveness come in? We have to consider what Christ did for us. He died and never held our sins against us. How could we hold someone's sin against them if we consider what we've done to him to put him on the cross? And the anguish that he suffered in our place, how could we hold that against someone else? We can't. God's the one that's going to have his justice on that day, not me. It doesn't matter. If, he's, if, if someone's persecuting me because of Christ, let God handle that. It's not worth it. There's no value. He's the one that's going to get the glory, not me. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30 and 31. We'll read through 32. I'll give you a minute to be there or to get there. And Paul says to the church of Ephesus, he says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, among, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Now, you can take that verse and say, well, he, you know, it's forgiving those in the church. He's not saying people outside of the church, but we'll get to that. So, I, you know, when I think of a redemption story and a story of persecution, uh, affliction, I, I think of Joseph and what he went through, and he was a picture of Christ um, saving, um, saving the Jews uh, being persecuted. They tried to kill him. They sold him off to slavery. He was slandered and lied about. And, and yet, what a beautiful story. So let's, let's look at, um, at Joseph. And in, in Genesis 37, um, Joseph was loved by Jacob more than his brothers. Joseph was blessed by his father. However, his brothers hated him and even plotted to kill him. But they sold him as a slave instead. Reuben said, no, we can't kill him. We, we don't want his blood on our hands. So they sold him off as a slave, and they wrote him off and told, his, told uh, Jacob that uh, he had been killed. 
So he, he had many, Joseph had many trials that he went through um, in that time. And we'll go to Genesis 45, and we'll start in verse 5, and we'll read a little bit about what happened. Here's his brothers put him in that. They wrote him off for dead. And then God, but God blessed him through the whole thing. He was lied about. Potiphar's wife accused him of, of rape, and, um, you know, he spent time in jail, um, but he, he rose again to power that God put him in a place and made him equal with Pharaoh. But he says, he says, and now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you as a remnant on earth and keep you alive, for, uh, keep you for many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He acknowledged that God was the one that put him in that position, not them. God used it to glorify himself. And, and God has made me a father to Pharaoh and a lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Isn't that beautiful? So he, he, I mean, you imagine what it would be like if your brothers that you cared about and they, uh, or your family, I don't care, think about it, your kids, and, and they wrote you off and they sold you into slavery. And, and they told your, your father you were dead. He, you know, he would rightfully so have built up a lot of anger if, if you really think about it. But when he considered who, who he was serving and what he was doing there, God put him there. He put him in that to glorify himself, to save the people, to keep a remnant. What a glorious thing that is. And uh, let's go to Genesis 50, verse 20. Just before his death. He says, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. You know when Christ died on the cross, that those that persecuted him and hung him on the cross, they meant it for evil. But God, God meant it for good. That was part of his plan, just like this was. Just like that persecution and affliction you're going through, God planned that for his benefit, for your benefit for him to be glorified and for you to be refined and conformed to the image of his son. But we'll look at um, forgiveness outside, you know, others that, you know, we should be forgiving even those that are not brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's go to Colossians 3, 12 and 13. So he says to the Colossians, he says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. If one has a complaint against another, oh, I'm sorry, I read ahead of you, didn't I? Sorry. Bearing with one another. If one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, and as the Lord has forgiven you, you must also forgive. You must also forgive as God has forgiven you. And it doesn't matter. If you can think of the most wicked thing that someone can do to you. You can be tortured to the inch of your life for 40 years. You know, they could, you think of just the most wicked thing and, and it doesn't even compare to the punishment that Christ took for you on that cross. Nothing. It's not even scratching the surface what he went through for us. Go to Matthew 6, 14 and 15. And while you're getting there, the word forgive is a Greek as, uh, in the Greek is called, it's spelled with an A, it's Ephesus, Ephesus, Ephesus. I don't want to say Ephesus because it sounds like the church of Ephesus. Ephesus. The definition is dismissal, release, pardon, or its usage is sending away, 
letting go or complete forgiveness. So when you forgive someone for something, you don't hold it against them. Now, if somebody, it, it, forgiving someone doesn't mean that you put yourself in harm's way. It doesn't mean that you trust that individual. It doesn't mean that you know if, if, uh, if there's abuse in a, in a marriage and you forgive your husband for the abuse, it doesn't mean that that, that trust is there but it means you're not holding that against them. You're not using that. You don't remember that against them in that sense. It doesn't mean that you, you put yourself in harm's way. You know, if, if somebody came against me, I mean, I, I need to watch myself because their sin has been revealed. And so, you know, until they come to complete repentance and you see it in their life and there's, there's a period of time where trust is earned, then you can, you know, trust again. But just because you forgive doesn't mean that you can put your or that you need to put yourself back into a an abusive situation. That's something to be considered because I think in the church the the, the church can get that wrong in in uh, places of abuse. Um, you know, think of even sexual abuse or anything like that. We don't want them put in that position again. It's obviously, that other individual that sinned has a temptation that they need to overcome, and they may never. So we have to keep that in mind. But forgiving them doesn't mean you hold it against them. So hopefully there's some clarity there. But Matthew 6, 14 and 15. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. So that's, that's the world. That's not just the church. You forgive other people. People cut you off in traffic. Forgive them. Be quick to forgive. I'm not a better driver than everybody else, and, and that's that's an easy one because we all struggle with it. We get in traffic. Somebody cuts us off. They drive too slow. Who am I? I'm not the perfect. I'd like to think I'm a perfect driver, but I'm not. I make mistakes too. I'm not perfect. Why would I hold that against somebody else? That's kind of ridiculous. But we do it. We we get angry. We get worked. Ah, I can't believe they cut me off. Do they know who I am? Or, I'm in a hurry. i got something to do. Well, my time isn't any more valuable than their time. We might think it is, just because someone's driving slow in front of us. You know, we can't, we can't do that. That's sinful. So let's go to Luke 23, 34. Uh, and Jesus said this just before... The, the soldiers that hung him on the cross, they, they cast lots for his garments. So basically, they were deciding who gets to take his robe. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. These are unbelievers. These are Gentiles. These are people that are not in the church. And he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And that should be our attitude as well to those that are outside of, the, outside of the church, but especially for those that are in the church. If you don't know your own heart, you should be quick to forgive. I know the thoughts that I have, my wicked thoughts that I have daily. I sin against the Savior every day, and I struggle with that. And, I, and I'll admit that to you. I, I struggle with sin, a, a multitude of sins. Um, and God grants me repentance in that and, and carries me through that. And, I, and he makes me better every day in that. How can I hold a sin that somebody does outward to me? You can't see my inward heart, my inward sins, but it's wicked. I know, I know, I know what goes on in here. I wouldn't want any of you even have a minute in my head. It's a dark, dead place. But I know that Jesus died for those sins too. What, a, what an amazing Savior we have. So in conclusion, can anybody tell me why, why we should not forgive someone? Is there a reason why we couldn't forgive someone? We, we should be quick to forgive anyone, no matter what they do to us. Christ is quick to forgive me. He died for me. So why also, why would we hold a grudge? It's the same thing. It's unforgiveness. 
causes bitterness. Another thing that I hear is, how do we forgive ourselves? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, and I'm going to be blunt, and I don't mean to offend, but um, get over yourself if you need to forgive yourself. And, and, that, and that's the truth. We don't have the power to forgive ourselves. We don't. And that, that would also say if you have to forgive yourself, then you're negating what Christ did for you as well. Christ's sacrifice was enough to cover that. Let's just get over it and move forward. Look to him. It's not about you. And then we need to consider our own heart when someone sins against us. No. Does anybody have anything? Any disagreements? Give me a scripture. God no? Is judge. God is the judge. And he said, vengeance is mine. Lord, I give these people to you. Amen. And that's, that's what we trust in. And the reality is, is I wouldn't want someone to be in the hands of God in judgment. That's a scary thought. You could think again, think of the most wicked thing, and it doesn't even compare to what that, what that uh, payment for sin is going to be in eternity in hell. You don't want even your worst enemy. You know, you could think of the most wicked person on earth, and man, that's a scary day for them, and I do not want them to be there. God gets glory by saving wicked sinners like you and me. So we need to get out there and preach the word and forgive those around us. It doesn't matter what what they do to us. It doesn't matter. Christ has me. He'll protect me. He's going to pay vengeance for that. And you know what? Praise God if he saves that person and, and they don't have to pay for it. That that sin can be put on the cross with Christ. You know, that'd be awesome. What a glorious day that'll be. To see someone that, and, and I have friends and people and family that, that have come against me for being a Christian, and God has saved those people. And what an amazing thing that is. I don't care about what they did to me. It doesn't matter. I want to see them in Christ. What an amazing thing. So we have a wonderful God and a wonderful Savior, and, and we need to remember that no matter what happens in our life. So, so I hope that encouraged you. Um, that's all I had. But, uh, yeah, go ahead, Ben. 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4. Okay, read that. First of all, then, I urge that requests, prayers, intercessions, and thanks be offered on behalf of all people, even for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Such prayers for all is good and welcome before God, our Savior, since he wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Amen. And a lot of times when you have trouble forgiving someone, praying for them helps you bring about that forgiveness within your heart. You're, that's a good point. It's, it, that helps. That's what we should do. It should drive us into prayer. We, we should repent of any, any wicked thoughts that we had against that individual. Give them over to Christ. Pray for their salvation. Or even if it's a brother or sister in Christ, pray that God will grant them repentance in that, that issue and will bring them around and, you know, and, and God gets glory in that. We can't do it ourselves. It's so easy in today's society to slander our leaders. Yep. You see it everywhere. Everywhere. But the Bible doesn't tell us slander our, the authority, go against the authority. It's just well, think of Nero. I mean, <laughs> these... People complain about how we have it right now. Inflation's terrible. Interest rates are up. You know, things are hard to get. Yeah, I mean, that, it's, we still have it better than most of the world. And, and yet we get people, you know, considering rising up against the government and, you know, slandering and calling names and threatening. And it's, that's not what we're about as Christians. We're to love those that persecute us. We're to love our enemy. Jesus even said that if your enemy is hungry, give him food. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. <laughs> right? Give him the shirt off your back. I mean, wow, that's, that's hard to do, but that's what we're called to do. We're called to do that, so. Most of the time, forgiveness is not for them. It's for who, who, who. Well, you're, you're right in a sense. Um, 
You know, because we forgive people in our heart, we may not even have to outward say it to someone. We just don't hold it against them. You know, we don't have hold charge against them um, in that sense. Sometimes we could tell somebody it may be as benefit. I mean, it depends on the situation to tell them, hey, I forgive you for that, especially if they're repentant. Usually if they're not, that's even harder to, to forgive if somebody doesn't want to admit that they're wrong. But I, we still don't need to hold it against them. It is for our benefit in that sense. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it is for the benefit of the other person too. I mean, and if you forgive them, you're not holding it against them. You're not going to remember it against them in a sense. So, so it benefits both. I mean, but it does benefit you more probably. You know, you don't have to hold that grudge and bear that bitterness. Bitterness is is terrible. It's it's a wicked thing. And I don't know if you know this, but uh, even um, biologically, bitterness is terrible for you. It it uh, causes all kinds of like your ar- arteries harden, and you know you it, it makes you sick, it makes you worried, you get paranoid. I mean, there's all kinds of things that bitterness causes in a, in one's life. We shouldn't be as Christians. We especially as Christians, we should not be holding bitterness against anyone. Anyone. There's no reason to. And if if you come up with a reason why. You can justify not forgiving someone or not giving up that bitterness. I would love to sit down and understand through Scripture how you could justify that, right? I mean, uh, especially as a Christian. So, anybody else? Anything have anything anything you want to share? No. All right, we'll close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word and. Thank you for those afflictions and trials that you give us. It's an honor that you would consider us for those things, as, even as minor as they are. I mean, really what's happened to me was nothing, nothing compared to what our brothers and sisters, especially overseas, have to deal with. They go to prison for, for preaching your word or, or even lined up and murdered, killed uh, for their faith, Father. So we pray for them. We also pray for our brothers and sisters, uh, Jackson and uh, Mariah there in Cuba, that you would protect them and guide them as they, as they go out and spread your word to, to, the, to the, the, the impoverished uh, nation of Cuba. So we pray blessings on them. You'll grow them through that trial. And uh, we pray for Brian again. We just pray that he's, he's able to rest, knowing that... Uh, he doesn't have to worry about church service, that, that we're here to take it over and, and run it for him while he's gone, and, and we look forward to him coming back. So we, uh, most of all, just thank you for sending your son to die for us, that even though we didn't deserve it, that you chose to send your son to take our place on that cross and raising him again, up again on the third day, defeating death for us, for our benefit so that we can be with you in glory. Just praise you and pray for your will to be done in this church. In Jesus' name, amen.